Stuckin and for everyone um, who's in on the NERVE series tonight. Um, Dr. Stuckin comes from University of Michigan and uh, she'll be talking with us about superior semicircular canal dehiscence. I'm super excited to have us, so thanks again. And I'll uh, turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Mallory. Nice to see you guys all tonight. Um, I am recovering from some laryngitis, so forgive me if my voice is a little scratchy and I'll try to hopefully make it to the presentation. Uh, for some reason with the tech, I'm not able to share both my um, video of myself and a presentation at the same time. So I'm gonna go over to the presentation and then I will come back at the end. All right, Mallory, tell me if you do not see or hear my presentation. <laughs> Looks good. Um, great, thanks. Okay, so I'm actually really excited to talk to you guys today about superior semicircular canal dehiscence um, because this is one of my favorite one of my favorite problems to treat. I think it's super interesting, and I think that um, if you kind of identify the right patient to treat, um, it can be tremendously impactful for the patients, and they tend to be really really grateful. Uh, I do not have any disclosures. So a little roadmap of how we're going to approach this topic. Uh, we're going to start off talking about a case of a patient uh, with this problem. And then we're going to talk a bit about some definitions, the pathophysiology, clinical presentation, um, a bit about the differential diagnosis, and then we'll dive into treatment. Um, so I came into clinic one day and um, you know I've got a little chart on the door that says there's a 53-year-old woman with otalgia. Okay. All right, 53-year-old woman with otalgia. Let's see what this is. And so I go in to see her. Um, and in fact, what, what had been kind of um, booked as otalgia was not really otalgia. Uh, rather, it was a complaint. And really, her presenting complaint was that um, sounds bother her. You know, a lot of times these patients won't necessarily have the right vocabulary to use all these terms that are buzzwords for us. And so it's important for us to figure out you know, really talk to the patients and figure out what is bothering them. So, you know, she'd been seeing providers and seeing providers and saying, my ear hurts, my ear hurts. Uh, but if you talk to her and you say, you know, what do you mean your ear hurts? Do you feel pain in your ear or on your ear? And she said, well, so, well no, it's not really pain. It's just like it really, you know, certain sounds just really, they're, they're painful. And I said, well, are they painful or do they bother you? And she said, yes, that's it. They, they bother me. Certain sounds bother me. I said, okay, well, now we're going somewhere. And you then you kind of, you know, are forming a differential in your mind and you start to ask about some of these other things. And sure enough, she had autophony, she had fullness in the ear, pulsatile tinnitus in that ear. Um, I asked her some of the other kind of screening questions for superior canal dehiscence. And she said, well, no, I never hear my eyes move back and forth. And then she thought about it for a minute and she said, but I do hear this really crunchy, crispy sound every time I put my contact lenses in. Is that what you mean? Um, and she also had some kind of vague, brief, episodic disequilibrium. So um, when I examined her, you know, her ears looked normal on exam. Her tuning fork exam with a 512 hertz tuning fork lateralized to that ear. And when I pulled out the 128 tuning fork um, and put it on her ankle, on her lateral malleolus, she said, sure enough, yeah, I, I kind of hear that right in my left ear. This was her audiogram. Um, we're just going to kind of brief briefly go over all these things with the case presentation, but then later on, we're really going to dive deeply into why all of these things are happening for these patients. But we could see from her audiogram that she had this characteristic low frequency air bone gap in the left ear with a bone conduction threshold between zero and negative five. And so I ended up ordering a CAT scan for her, which confirmed the diagnosis of superior semicircular canal dehiscence and really superior canal dehiscence syndrome for her. Um, so the image on the left is the partial image. Can you, uh, Mallory, can you see my mouse or no? Yes, we can see your mouse. Okay, great. So you can kind of see that the top of that superior semicircular canal is just lopped off there. And on the Stenver view or orthogonal to the plane of the superior semicircular canal, we can say that that dot is missing its roof. So, you know, with a little bit of background about what kind of patients we'll be seeing with these disorders, um, I want to start fresh, basically with some definitions. And if everyone can like really tune in for a second on this slide, because um, this is really fundamental and important to understanding how to most appropriately treat these patients. There is a difference between having a canal dehiscence, which is referred to as superior canal dehiscence or superior semicircular canal dehiscence radiographically, and having superior canal dehiscence syndrome, 
which means you have the radiographic evidence of the canal dehiscence in addition to the characteristic symptoms that can be focally attributed to this dehiscence in addition to the supporting electrophysiological abnormalities. So we really have to kind of understand which of our patients that we're seeing may just have a superior canal dehiscence from which they're asymptomatic and, and who has really the symptomatology that warrants a discussion of active management. This understanding this key difference um, will probably make the biggest difference in your practice between really liking to treat these patients and, and really perhaps not liking so much to treat these patients because if you operate on the wrong patient, um, it can be kind of a nightmare for this. So superior canal dehiscence syndrome, you know, this is a relatively new diagnosis um, for folks who are training now and folks such as myself who trained once this had been established, we kind of just think of it like, you know, everyone knows about this, but in fact, you know, this was first described 22 years ago, um, which in the grand scheme of medicine is really, really recent. And so Lloyd Minor recognized this and, and wrote about it in 1998, describing a small subset of patients with chronic disequilibrium who also had these weird symptoms of either sound or pressure induced vertigo. Um, and he described symptoms of bone conduction hyperacusis. We'll talk a little more about that, but I love that phrase. Pulsatile tinnitus, and then identified uh, that these patients seem to have a bony dehiscence over their superior semicircular canal on CT. Uh, we don't know why people get this. So there are arguments made for either congenital causes or acquired causes. Um, there was a temporal bone study performed at Hopkins looking at a lot of bones um, who had this diagnosis and they didn't show any signs of bony remodeling. Um, and so they felt it was most, like, most likely congenital. There have also been studies um, looking at the radiographic incidence of superior canal dehiscence, which tends to be higher um, actually in, in young people. And then it seems like over time that incidence goes down. So perhaps there is still um, some covering of the bone that is happening early in life. Um, other people argue that's acquired based on either um, a, a fairly significant number of patients who first develop symptoms after some sort of trauma or also due to the association between superior canal dehiscence and other radiographic dehiscence of the tegmin um, which may be thought to be related to increased intracranial pressure and kind of wear and tear from pulsations of arachnoid granulations, et cetera, um, along the middle fossa. And so, you know, both of these uh, explanations have been entertained. I'd say um, there's probably a little more likelihood of congenital versus acquired, but probably could be either. You know, most of these patients are not obese. They're not the increased ICP patients. Um, and so I'd say for right now, we just call it idiopathic and, and still trying to figure out how this happens. But however, the, whatever the etiology is, um, we're pretty sure we figure out what the pathophysiology is, which is this third window phenomenon. People toss around that phrase a little bit. So what does that mean? Well, in the inner ear under normal conditions, there are two openings into the bony labyrinth, uh, which are the oval window and the round window. And within the bony labyrinth that houses the, the auditory system as well as the vestibular system, um, which are adjacent, but, but not intertwined um, so much. And what happens when there's an extra hole or a third window, um, especially as we're talking about in the superior semicircular canal, it creates um, really abnormal reverberation of sound in the ear, such that acoustic stimuli can now traverse through the vestibular system and leave through that low impedance pathway of the superior canal dehiscence. And so it really causes this kind of mixing of audio and vestibular symptoms um, because of you're your having an acoustic stimulus that now is stimulating the vestibular system as those acoustic sound waves are traversing through that hole. Um, the third window also uh, explains these, you know, funky vertigo and nystagmus patterns that we see, um, namely noise or pressure induced vertigo and nystagmus. Um, so if you play a loud sound or uh, deliver positive pressure to the ear canal or have the patient valsalva against pinched nostrils, you'll get an excitatory response and you can actually see nystagmus and the patient will um, experience vertigo in many patients with this. 
And then the reverse is true. Um, if you exhibit uh, or put negative pressure into the EAC um, or you have the patient's valsalva against a closed glottis, they'll have kind of the opposite pattern of nystagmus. Um, and, and once again, will experience vertigo. Um, I think the pathophysiology of the, the audiometric findings is really interesting. Um, so the, there are a couple of explanations for what we see on the audiograms. Um, this was a, a kind of a cool paper um, by Sam Merchant, where he, he proposed why we see what we do on the audiogram. And we'll kind of go through each one of these figures. Um, figure A is just the normal system of air conduction in the ear. Like you would see with this big arrow here, sound right is going through, um, vibrating through the tympanic membrane, acicular chain, uh, through the oval window. And then that difference in um, sound energy between the scale of vestibular and the scale of tympany is vibrating our cochlear partition and exciting our auditory system here. So that's kind of our normal air conduction pathway. And B is the third window lesions, how air conduction happens. And I don't think it pretty much makes sense. It's somewhat intuitive. So in that same system, you have a shunting of sound waves out through that canal of the Hissens. And so because of that, you're not going to have as much of a pressure gradient on either side of the cochlear partition. And that's going to show up as a conductive hearing loss, which mainly affects the lower frequencies here just because of the shape of the ear. So that all kind of makes sense. Um, it gets a little bit more interesting, I think, when we talk about bone conduction and, and why there is that abnormal bone conduction finding that's so classic with this um, syndrome. So figure C here is a normal ear bone conduction um, where we're vibrating the bone, which is stimulating um, the, the scale of vestibuli, the scale of tympany here and causing deflections again across, across the cochlear partition. Um, and in this, in this um, kind of physiological explanation by Merchant, um, he argues that there's a difference in impedance uh, across the oval window and the round window because the oval window is plugged with the stapes foot plate here. And so that um, plays a part in the normal vibrations and the normal um, deflections of the cochlear partition. And so he argues in D here that with a third window lesion, when you're losing sound energy from this third window lesion or really any third window that is on the scale of a stibuli side of the cochlear partition, he argues that now that impedance, which is already lower, is gonna, you're gonna be, um, which is already different, you're gonna be losing more sound waves out of there. And so you're gonna have this kind of increase in differential across the cochlear partition which will thus stimulate your auditory system more and you'll have an, a supranormal bone connection threshold. Um, this explanation is a, a little bit different from others who have posited that really um, what happens with the bone conduction in third windows is that you're getting, um, you're actually getting stimulation through that's traveling in through the dehiscence and contributing to the auditory stimulation on the, on the um, scale of a stability side which is again, just affecting the difference in cochlear partition, difference in pressures across the cochlear partition um, and leading to increased excitation. So um, what that leads to for patients are some really funky symptoms. So these patients will have autophony, um, autophony to voice. They'll have pulsatile tinnitus, which really should localize to the affected ear. They will oftentimes have hyperacusis um, and oftentimes they'll have hyperacusis to very specific frequencies or very specific sounds. Um, they'll hear their internal noises very loudly in the affected ear. So um, frequently, if you ask if they can hear their eyes move, um, they may or may not have noticed this. And they'll usually sit in your office and start doing all this funky eye movements. And then they'll say, whoa, yeah, I can. Um, or they they perceive that the sound of their own footsteps is dramatically loud in the affected ear, um, or that other internal noises such as chewing are, are so loud. And it's interesting, you know, these patients have auditory and vestibular symptoms oftentimes, but some of these auditory symptoms, particularly the autophony and hearing your own chewing um, and the hyperacusis tend to be some of the most bothersome symptoms in the patients who, um, oftentimes are really, really bothered by the symptomatology, you know, tell me that they have trouble even carrying on a conversation or participating in, you know, a dinner or a mealtime um, with other folks because all they can hear is their own speech and their own chewing. 
And so really I have patients who start to experience social isolation because they just, they can't even carry on a conversation. Um, and so it, it can be pretty debilitating for patients. The vestibular symptoms, um, because of that third window phenomenon, folks get this sound induced vertigo and pressure induced vertigo. Um, and oftentimes patients will also get this sense of brain fog or just kind of this vague feeling not quite grounded. Um, again, patients may or may not be able to, to tell you about these. And so these are always questions to ask them about. Um, there are some patients who can tell you this. So, um, when I was in fellowship, we had one patient who was an announcer uh, for hockey games. And anytime anybody scored a goal in hockey, you know, they play that like blaring big sound and he would almost fall off his chair every time because the whole world would start spinning around. Um, and so he was pretty certain he knew about that. We've got another patient who works construction um, and he was terrified to go up on ladders because every time, you know, there's a big loud noise around construction, everything would start moving on him for a few seconds. And, and that was particularly concerning to him when he was working on ladders. And so sometimes people will notice this, sometimes not. Um, and I'll say these symptoms are present to a variable degree in different patients. Um, so you can have some of these patients, some of these symptoms, but not others. And that all plays a role in factoring in um, the optimal treatment strategy for each patient. So it's really worth it to spend some time with these patients um, and do a pretty deep dive into their symptoms to figure out, A, am I really sure that these symptoms are coming from this hole that I see on the CAT scan? Um, and B, you know, are these symptoms that I can treat? So I'm gonna pause for a minute. This is kind of the, the other like big important slide um, that I'd love to draw your attention to, which is just figuring out, you know, the differential for two reasons. One, so we can figure out when to look for this. Um, but the second one is really so we can figure out when to treat this because there can be overlap between this disorder and other disorders that have similar symptoms. And we have to make sure that we're treating the right problem, especially when we talk about surgery, which, which you know, plugs off um, part of your balance system. So the, the main things that I find have overlap in symptoms with superior canal dehiscence syndrome are migraine. So vestibular migraine patients oftentimes uh, may have, you know, this brain fog, chronic disequilibrium, may be bothered by loud sounds, um, may have hyperacusis. There's a lot of overlap there. Eustachian tube dysfunction. Um, these patients can sometimes trick you. They can come in with that little bit of low frequency air bone gap, and they can tell you, gosh, my ear just feels really plugged. Um, you know, sometimes they can even have a little bit of autophony if they've gotten a fusion or if they've got enough negative pressure there. Um, and so it's or important to distinguish. Other third windows. So, you know, we oftentimes kind of equate in our minds third window with superior canal dehiscence, but in fact, you can have other third window phenomenons. Um, so you can have spontaneous dehiscence of the posterior semicircular canal. Make sure you're looking for that on the axials if you don't see superior canal dehiscence. Um, cochlear carotid fistulas, other weird funky things um, that could cause third window symptoms very similar to superior canal dehiscence. Other causes for conductive hearing loss. So, you know, a lot of patients back in the day before this was discovered um, fell into this category who had presumed otosclerosis with a low frequency air bone gap and were taken to surgery uh, without findings of stapes foot plate fixation. And now the thought is that probably, you know, some or a lot of those patients actually had superior canal dehiscence. Uh, we just didn't have good enough CAT scans to pick it up. And finally, patchless eustachian tube. Um, there's definitely a lot of, of potential overlap in symptoms between superior canal dehiscence and patchless eustachian tube, particularly with the autophony and fullness that patients feel and hear. Um, so a couple of ways we can distinguish this. One is, um, to ask them about postural signs for patchless eustachian tube, it's pretty reliable that their symptoms are relieved when they put their head in a dependent position. Usually it takes a couple seconds, um, but I oftentimes ask folks in whom I suspect patchless eustachian tube right there in the office. I'll say, do you have it right now? If they do, I'll say, all right, do me a favor, put your head down by your knees and just wait there for 30 seconds. Tell me if it goes away. And usually after about five seconds or so, those symptoms will completely resolve. And then when they put their head back up to a normal position, symptoms come back in a couple of, a couple of seconds. Um, superior canal dehiscence, there have been um, 
some folks have described potentially some differences in symptoms with lying supine versus standing up. Um, so you can't necessarily use that alone, although I find it's much more exaggerated in patchless eustachian tube. The other really helpful thing to ask patients who may have patchless eustachian tube um, is what makes it better. So a lot of times these patients have noticed, um, you know, separate or, or different from your eustachian tube dysfunction patients who will be chronically popping their ears and, and valsalvaing, patchless eustachian tube patients oftentimes have discovered it's better when they sniff in. And so sometimes you'll be, you'll notice this just in your encounter before you ask them anything, that they're kind of chronic sniffers. And that it seems like every other sentence, they're sniffing in and closing off their pat, their, their eustachian tube and it feels better to them. Um, and so those I find to be kind of the top two things that help me identify when a patient may have patchless eustachian tube rather than superior canal dehiscence are, is it better when your head is down and is it better or worse by sniffing in um, compared to, to trying to pop your ears or valsalva? So it's really important to, to consider all these things in your differential for two reasons. Um, one is to make sure that we're identifying this. Um, many, many folks who you see with superior semicircular canal dehiscence, they have had these symptoms for years and they've seen multiple providers. Um, and a lot of them really think that they are going crazy. And I say that because that's what patients tell me. Um, I've had patients who have enrolled in clinical studies for traumatic brain injury because they say, you know, just no one has been able to figure this out. I think this is just some weird TBI effect. Um, and and so we've got to figure out, you know, when do we scan patients and do that appropriately? But the second reason to consider these things in the differential is really from a treatment perspective. Patients may have both. Um, there are many patients who have superior canal dehiscence syndrome and migraine. There are patients who have superior canal dehiscence syndrome and eustachian tube dysfunction or patchless eustachian tube. And so it complicates things because we've got to figure out as providers what to treat, either what to treat first or what to treat in isolation. Um, and I've seen this a handful of times with things like eustachian tube dysfunction where you know a patient is referred, they've already had a CAT scan, they've got clear superior canal dehiscence on their CAT scan. Um, and they come in and they say, oh, I've got, you know, what are your symptoms? I've got ear fullness. I've got some intermittent pulse style tinnitus. I've got autophony in that ear. And you look in the ear and they've got a retracted tympanic membrane, type C TIMS, or sometimes frank effusion. Um, and if you kind of go through all the symptoms with them, I've had a couple of patients who were, you know, had all their symptoms, which could have been portrayed as classic SCD symptoms, um, all resolved with putting in a tympanoscopy tube. And so um, it really behooves us to spend a lot of time with these patients trying to figure out where their symptoms are coming from and, and really get a good characterization of the symptoms. On physical exam, there's usually not much going on in terms of otoscopy. They generally have a pretty normal ear. Um, oftentimes the tuning fork examination, uh, the patient will lateralize sound to the affected side with a 512 hertz tuning fork, as long as they've got enough of an airbone gap there. Um, and then there's this interesting phenomenon that's been described that if you put a, a, a low frequency tuning fork, so 128 or 256 hertz uh, tuning fork on the malleolus, um, that oftentimes the patients will perceive that in the affected ear. Um, and you can also try doing a fistula test um, with a bulb in the clinic and seeing if they get vertigo or nystagmus with that. Okay, well, let's spend a couple minutes on audiometry because this is important. Um, so this is kind of a, a somewhat of a classic audiogram, except forget the 4,000 Hertz notch here. That part is not part of a classic superior canal dehiscence audiogram, um, but we're gonna break this down and, and really go over all the things about this that are somewhat classic. So first of all, there's this low frequency air bone gap. Um, if you've got a patient who's coming in with these symptoms and you see this audiogram, um, this is really one of the, the first things you should think of is, gosh, should I be scanning this patient? Could they have superior canal dehiscence? It tends to close kind of the mid-frequencies. The second thing is the bone line. Um, oftentimes the bone line will be at zero or in the negative range. There are a couple of ways to describe this phenomenon. Um, some people will say supranormal bone conduction thresholds. I think it, it can at times be misleading um, to talk about supra or elevated or depressed when we're talking about audiometric findings because um, some folks will talk about elevation to describe 
uh, higher decibel levels versus some folks will talk about elevation to describe higher on the audiogram. Um, so, so super normal bone conduction spectrals, I think is an okay way to say it. Um, probably the most clear way is just describe exactly what you see on the audiogram. So you could say that this patient has a low frequency air bone gap with bone line thresholds between zero and negative five decibels in the low frequencies. Um, and that's kind of an accurate way of, of describing it where someone else listening knows exactly what to picture on that audiogram. Patients should have normal uh, speech discrimination scores, type A panograms, and intact acoustic reflexes. Um, if they don't have any of those kind of classic findings, you got to take a step back and figure out why. Um, does this patient also have otosclerosis if they have a fitting reflex pattern? You know, does this patient, if they've got a, a type C TIMP, do they have eustachian tube dysfunction? Uh, what else is going on if it's not kind of this straightforward pattern? Um, so if you suspect in your clinical encounter that they may have superior canal dehiscence, there are some electrophysiologic tests that are helpful. Um, so primarily we look at CVEMPs and OVEMPs, um, and what you'll find is decreased thresholds, particularly on CVEMPs, and increased amplitudes, particularly on OVEMPs. Um, this is kind of the classic teaching, and this is what I always learned in training to, to look at these values. Um, at University of Michigan, we also use electrocochleography quite a bit. Um, and we're looking for elevated SP to AP ratios. So when I was in training, I always learned about elevated SP to AP for Meniere's disease. Um, and that was kind of the classic thing. And after I finished fellowship and um, started at University of Michigan, you know, I started seeing these patients and discussing them and, and presenting them at our conferences. And all of my colleagues were relying uh, more heavily on electrocochleography than they were on VEMS. And I was going, what the heck are these people doing? Um, and so I, I looked at the literature. This was um, described by Alex Arts and Meredith Adams 10 years ago um, and has since been repeated by, by multiple other centers. And sure enough, um, this is a highly reliable indicator. Um, it tends to correlate really well with symptomatic superior canal dehiscence, which is really interesting. Um, and so I've really adopted it in my practice, especially because you'll see when we talk about treatment, it can be really helpful to use this intraoperatively um, to get really a, a real time um, characterization of opening and then closing the third window intraoperatively. So this is a really, really nice tool that's probably worth looking into using um, if you're not using it wherever you are practicing. And then uh, we look for imaging. So uh, superior canal dehiscence, uh, sometimes you can even kind of get a glimpse of it on the axials, right? You're scrolling through the axials on a CT scan and and you're looking at you know all the normal anatomic structures and you look at the superior semicircular canal dome or part of it and then the next cut you're in brain and you kind of think to yourself ha huh, let me look at these coronals um and the coronals can suggest superior canal dehiscence but really in order to make the the definite diagnosis it's helpful to have these reconstructions uh the postural and sender reconstructions so the postural on the left is a reconstruction performed in the plane of the superior semicircular canal and what you can see um, is basically just kind of the top of that superior canal gets lopped off in those images. And then the Stenberg view, uh, the Stenberg view is really, really helpful. You can see here, we should have a nice little focal circle of our superior semicircular canal. But again, that's kind of chopped off halfway. And as you scroll through your Stenberg views, you really want to see a true dehiscence um, over several contiguous um, slices to make sure it's real. MRI is kind of not standard. Um, I don't usually order MRI. Sometimes you'll get an MRI where it may suggest, based on the fluid sequence and proximity to the brain, may suggest that there's not intervening bone there, but it's really not diagnostic. Um, and certainly you would need those nice, heavily weighted T2 fast fit echo sequences, like either your Fiesta or your KISS or whichever um, technology your institution uses. You need those really um, high fidelity images to see the fluid signal of the superior canal adjacent to the brain. Uh, but even that, I, I really wouldn't trust that alone, that I would follow up with the CT to make the diagnosis. Okay, take a quick water break from my laryngitis here. So now we've got this patient, got them in your office. They've got these kind of classical symptoms um, classical findings on imaging, on electrophysiology. 
uh, what do you do? What do you do for them? Well, it kind of comes down to three parts. Um, there are some patients, actually uh, many patients, in whom we just observe this. And it really will come down to their symptoms. If their symptoms are not that bothersome, oftentimes the treatment is worse than the disease. And we just observe. And I should say by observation, actually, I just mean non-operative management. I don't you know, follow these patients. We're not getting serial CT scans. Uh, we're kind of telling them about the diagnosis and then releasing them into the wild to go live their life with it. Um, there is no medical management for this. Surgical management is comprised of plugging and resurfacing the hole in the canal. Um, the kind of, if you go back to those original reports um, in 98 by Lloyd Minor, they started off in, in the first group of patients trying to just resurface the canal without plugging, uh, but found that in a, a fair number of patients that they had recurrent symptoms. And so really uh, what we do now is both plug the superior semicircular canal and resurface. And you wanna make sure um, that you're really treating any of those co-incident disorders that we talked about, um, whether or not you're, you're performing the surgery. So like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you'll see a patient that, yes, they've got superior canal, the his and other cap scan, but all they really need is treatment of their eustachian tube dysfunction and all their symptoms will be better or their patchless eustachian tube or their migraine. Um, and so it really comes down to a discussion with the patient about their symptoms and then determining, you know, what, if anything, do you attack first? Do you attack that other disorder that may be present even though they have radiographic evidence of superior canal dehiscence on imaging? Um, or are you pretty convinced that this is causing their symptoms? So um, treatment really comes down to being very careful with patient selection and very um, honest about patient expectations. So I spend, Really, other than vestibular schwannomas, I spend the most time with these patients by far because um, I really want to make sure that, that if I'm going to offer them surgery, it's going to treat the things that they want treated. And I want to make sure that um, it can be potentially effective for the symptoms that they want treated. So a lot of patients, going back to the observation arm, a lot of times we have this whole discussion, we have a whole discussion about surgery, and then we jointly agree that, gosh, you know, all the rest I'm going to tell you about in a minute about surgery are probably not worth it for this, you know, fullness in the ear and sometimes hearing your heartbeat. And they say, I just wanted to know what it was. You told me what it was. That surgery sounds terrible. And I don't want to have anything to do with that. And that's perfectly fine. Um, the patient expectations part is big. So, you know, a lot of patients will have radiographic evidence of superior canal dehiscence. And they may have a constellation of symptoms. Um, but I've had this a couple of times where I just ask patients, you know, if I'm not real, real convinced that their symptoms are coming from this, I ask them, what, what are you hoping to solve with surgery? Especially in patients who seem to be, um, perhaps have unrealistic expectations. And I can't tell you the number of times that patients have answered that question by saying, I just have this loud ringing in both my ears all the time and I need it to go away. I just have this foghorn noise, jet engine noise in my head all the time and I need it to go away. And it's really their chronic non pulsatile bilateral tinnitus that they are seeking treatment for. Um, and this will not treat that. And so it's really, really important to talk with patients ahead of time. If there's kind of one most important message I can, can um, relay on this is if you, if you um, want to enjoy taking care of this disorder as much as I do, then, then make sure that you're offering treatment to patients um, who you can help. Otherwise it's really torture. Um, cause these patients are really bothered by, by certain symptoms. And if you can't help them with a surgery you're proposing, then don't do it. So if you have deemed that they're an appropriate surgical candidate and, you know, it seems like it's really the symptoms they are after are the symptoms that we can fix. Um, you can do this one of two ways. You can either do this by a middle cranial fossa approach or a transmastoid approach. And they're both actually pretty effective. Um, there are pluses and minuses to both approaches. And on the whole, I'd say this comes down to two factors in deciding. Um, one is the patient's anatomy, and the second is just surgeon preference. And this is one of those things where you kind of say, you know, in my hands, this seems to work best. Um, so anatomic variables. Um, sometimes if a patient has a real, you know, contracted mastoid, you may not have room to do a transmastoid approach. Middle fossa approach would definitely be better. A middle fossa approach will give you um, 
potentially a better head on view of the canal dehiscence itself. So you can really see the dehiscence as you're plugging it. Um, now I say uh, potentially because sometimes you'll have a dehiscence that's really like on the on the medial side of the superior semicircular canal. And so in fact, it's really not in your direct line of sight. You've got to retract the brain quite a bit in order to see around the dome of the canal to see that to his area. Um, Transmastoid uh, can be helpful, you know, when somebody's got good anatomy. And in particular, I'm going to show you guys a, a case in a moment um, who had kind of a unique reason for why transmastoid approach was, was preferred. Um, really, I think either one of these are good approaches. If there's no kind of anatomic reason to prefer one over the other, uh, my preference tends to be transmastoid, just because I think that um, it's a lot less to recover from, from a middle fossa craniotomy, but they both work well. You know, I'm happy and comfortable to do either, just depending on the patient. So um, I'm gonna kind of go over our steps if we're gonna do it transmastoid. So uh, this is a guy I saw, uh, really interesting guy actually. So. Um, this guy came to me just as an example of how sometimes the patients can't quite describe their symptoms to you the way that you're looking for them to describe them. Um, this guy came in and, and, you know, he had some symptoms that made me suspect this entity. And I was asking him, you know, do loud sounds ever make you dizzy? Do, um, you know, change it pressure? You, you bend down, lift something heavy. Does that ever make you dizzy? He said, no, no. He said, but I get like, like heartbeat dizziness. So what do you mean? He said, you know what? It's like the my heartbeat, but it's a it's like I feel dizzy every time my heart beats. And he kind of made this motion, like it, you know, in tune with his heartbeat that he had basically pulsatile dizziness. I said, okay, well, that's a new one. Um, scanned him, and you can see he does have a, a focal dehiscence of a superior semicircular canal. Um, but if you notice, it's caused really by this indentation of a structure here, which is his superior petrosal sinus. So I've seen this twice of superior petrosal sinus causing a focal dehiscence into the superior semicircular canal. And this guy was just really interesting because that was one of his presenting symptoms was pulsatile dizziness. And as soon as I saw the scan, I said, well, I guess that makes sense. Um, and so for this gentleman, um, there are two reasons in, for why, um, two reasons why a transmastoid approach is recommended for him. Um, one is, again, this is one of those cases where the dehiscence is really on the medial side of that superior semicircular canal. So you go into middle fossa and you're just gonna see what looks like a pretty normal superior semicircular canal. And you're gonna have to get yourself all the way to the other side of that or use some curved endoscopes to see that. And so it's really not that easy to see from a middle fossa approach. The second is um, once you see it, the only way you're gonna see that is if you're elevating um, the superior petrosal sinus out of that dehiscent area. Um, and if you tear that, it's gonna be a booger fix because you're kind of, you know, reaching around a quarter in a tight spot um, with a lot of blood now. And so, you know, this is something that's probably worth looking for because like I said, I've seen this a couple of times and it's just better if you can avoid that vein altogether, stay out of it by going transmastoid. And so that's what we did for this gentleman. So um, if you're gonna start off the operation, you are gonna do a mastoidectomy, um, kind of focused on the area of the superior semicircular canal and identify that and you're gonna blue line it. So you're gonna show yourself the lumen of the, of the canal, but really you're gonna keep that periosteum over there and just thin the bone over the superior semicircular canal. Now, um, in this case, you'll see, we don't actually see his dehiscence at any point when we're doing this operation. Um, sometimes you can kind of peek up because we're coming at it from the side, right? We're not coming at it top down. We're not approaching it primarily from the dehiscence. We're coming at it from the side. Um, you can sometimes kind of peek in through that or use endoscopes to look in through that and, and see the dehiscence. Um, but in this gentleman, we don't. What we're going to do next is actually um, create a little opening, a little labyrinthotomy on either side of the dehiscence first and isolate the dehiscence. And so I tend to open up the ampulated end and pack that off with fascia first. And then we'll do the same thing for the non-ampulated end. And so I'm just approaching this on either side of where radiographically that dehiscence was. And then we're going to open up the center, um, being real, real careful. Even though we've kind of isolated this now, you still want to avoid suction. Um, you want to kind of be able to work in water and also use of wax cell sponges could be really helpful for um, wicking away fluid without suctioning here and perturbing any of those delicate membranes. Um, and then I pack bone pate and bone wax in that intervening bone. Um, I should say too, so you don't want to suction, you don't want to traumatize. 
you also really the goal is to stay outside of the membranous labyrinth and just compress the labyrinth extrinsically. Um, and so I, like I said, I kind of packed that intervening segment with bone pate, with some bone wax. Um, and then I've started putting a bunch of otomimics or whatever your um, bone cement du jour is that you prefer to use. I started doing this after I had one patient on whom I fixed, uh, did a transmaster to repair for a superior canal dehiscence and the recovery room got a page from the nurse and they said, when can she restart her CPAP? And I said, oh, I didn't know she was on CPAP. Um, in general, I'm pretty liberal, liberal with going back on CPAP right away um, because I think that folks with significant OSA can be sneaky sick and um, sometimes sicker than you think. And it, it, I'd rather have them perturb their middle ear repair than you know die. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty, get them back on CPAP pretty quick. Um, but I definitely had a moment with that patient where I was like, well, so much for all that really delicate, you know, work that we just did in the ear. I hope it doesn't get blown out of place. And so um, following that, I started just, you know, putting a final layer of bone cement over all of this reconstruction. And then I feel like that's pretty secure and, and there's very little that people can do to mess that up after it's been done. Um, what's really cool about using electrocochleography is if we kind of go back, um, so we use electrocochleography intra-op um, for all of our superior canal dehiscence repairs. And interestingly, we're usually able to do this uh, from certainly from middle fossa approach, but also from a transmastoid. If you just try not to get too much um, irrigation fluid in the middle ear, this usually works and you usually can maintain a tracing throughout the surgery. And so um, I told you before that these patients, patients tend to have elevated SP to AP ratio pre-op. So this guy, I think his, I think his ratio was like 0.56 or something like that. And when you um, first open everything up in the system, uh, you're getting real-time readings and that SPAP ratio usually goes through the roof. I mean, it's usually like one, this guy was over one. Um, and then you plug it and then it goes down to like, I think it was just 0.12 or something like that. And so um, even though you're not getting, with this approach, you're not getting direct visualization of the fistula, of the dehiscence, you actually can get real-time feedback um, to give yourself some reassurance that yes, you have appropriately plugged the canal, um, which is a nice way to do it. Okay, um, this is the last slide. So expectations of surgery, um, you know, I was talking a bit about this before we went through that. This is like probably maybe the most important slide. Uh, what I found is there are some of these symptoms that we do a better job of helping than others. Um, the symptoms that the surgery works really well for are autophony, um, tends to work really well for autophony. Oh, one note on autophony. Uh, these patients tend to get autophony to voice, but they should not have autophony to breathing. That's the other way you can distinguish this entity from patchless eustachian tube is, is those folks will have autophony to voice, but also to breathing. And these folks should not have air autophony. Um, but the surgery tends to work pretty well for autophony, tends to work really, um, pretty well for hearing those internal noises, chewing, eyes moving, uh, tends to work quite well for pulse to health tinnitus, tends to work well for hyperacusis, um, tends to work well for that episodic dizziness, but it's a trade-off, right? Because you are removing part of their functional balance system. And so immediately after surgery, they will have disequilibrium and imbalance. And you got to really tell them about that ahead of time so they expect it. Um, the things that this does not help, this is not going to help that bilateral non pulsatile chronic tinnitus uh, may exacerbate it, but it's not going to help it. This is not going to help their migraine symptoms. There can be, you know, some of that interplay with brain fog, et cetera, that, that maybe that can get a bit better, a bit better with this. But if most of their symptoms really sound more like migraine than focal superior canal dehiscence symptoms, um, they will not be better made better by the surgery. And sure enough, the literature um, overall shows that patients who have concurrent vestibular migraine tend to do more poorly um, after surgery than others. Um, risk of surgery, kind of in this black circle here, chronic imbalance of sensory neural hearing loss. Um, these are real risks of this surgery. So, you know, if you think back to like the first time you ever drilled out a mastoid in temporal bone lab or wherever, Right? What did your attending tell you? They said, like, do not under any circumstances touch your drill to that lateral semicircular canal. Do not 
touch that drill to the incus because you're going to transmit forces through the inner ear. You are going to deafen this patient. You are going to cause lifelong vestibular dysfunction, right? That was like ingrained into us. And now all of a sudden we're saying like, but turns out you could actually drill away the whole part of the superior semicircular canal and kind of get away with it, um, you know, in a very controlled manner at a drill speed of, of 10,000 RPMs. Um, and it is amazing that we do get away with it for the most part, but there's about a 25% incidence of high frequency sensory neural hearing loss, which is big, right? Like most of our ear surgeries, right? Those of us who do mainly ear surgery, um, we always counsel our patients about hearing loss with any type of ear surgery. But in our heart of hearts, we probably believe that the, the incidence of sensory neural hearing loss with most middle ear surgery is pretty darn low. Um, but this is real. This is, you know, we are operating on the inner ear. We are perturbing the pressures in the inner ear. And that is real. Um, and similarly, chronic imbalance, especially in folks um, who have some other kind of concurrent balance disease, uh, whether it be otologic or non-otologic, you know, the folks who have peripheral neuropathy, significant vision loss, these other things that we really rely on um, for, for, for compensation after a vestibular insult, um, those folks are definitely at risk for chronic imbalance. And so I spend really a, a lot of time ahead of time understanding patient symptoms, addressing appropriate expectations. And to be honest with you, for these patients, I kind of read them the riot act about the risks um, because the risks are real. And after all that, if they still um, feel that what they are experiencing is so severe that it's worth them to take all of those risks, then they're probably a good candidate as long as they've got their radiographic and the electrophysiological correlates. Um, and they'll probably actually do pretty well. So I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody. And see if I can turn my camera back on. There we go. All right. Um, so that's a bit about superior canal dehiscence and happy to entertain any questions. That was an awesome talk, Dr. Stuckin. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I'll start off by saying at MUSC, we have a slightly different approach um, in terms of surgery. Um, other, otherwise, I think everything is very similar. Um, we're more often doing middle fossa and more often doing more qualified resurfacing with a little bit of added pressure, bone wax. Um, and so um, I, I guess I don't have a really well-formed question, but just curious about your thoughts on taking out the function of that superior canal when you're going transmastoid and you're plugging both sides. Um, I know you mentioned the long-term imbalance um, risks, but how how do you feel if you have a set of patients who you're comparing between your transmastoid plugging approach and your mid fossa, um, and and especially in patients who have concurrent, let's say, migraine vestibular migraine, do you notice that taking out that superior canal function has a larger impact in those patients? Yeah, great question. So, you know, in my, um, I've been out now six or seven years. In training, I train about 50 50. Um, about half the folks I work with did middle fossil repairs for these, about half the folks did transmastoid. And so um, I came out and I wasn't really sure which way I'd prefer. I say over time, I've definitely gravitated more toward doing a transmastoid for two reasons. Um, one is that I just think it's a better recovery. And it, especially actually in those vestibular migraine patients, I really worry about doing middle fossil surgery on them with exacerbation of migraines, headaches from their middle fossa surgery. Um, but the second is I actually find it to be a little more controlled. Um, when, we, when we do this middle fossa, right? You're elevating dura, elevating dura, and at some point you're gonna elevate dura off of your membranous labyrinth. Like that, you're gonna have to do that. Uh, you're gonna be suctioning around, you're gonna have to do that. Versus um, when you kind of come at it from the side, it just, to me, it feels a little bit more controlled that you have a bloodless plane where you're like, okay, I know exactly where it is because I'm staring at the superior canal and now I can just like ever so slightly chip off the bone around it. And so I find it to be a little more controlled, but honestly, I think they're both good approaches. Um, I'd be interesting, do, 
I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but do you guys ever do any vestibular testing post op of those patients to determine if they have any vestibulopathy or any like V hit in the plane of the super canal or anything like that to see where their post op function is? I can't recall any patients that we've done that, but post operatively on physical exam, we have been able to identify some patients who have had somewhat of like an irritated lesion and somewhat of a uh, like a dysfunction, hypofunctional lesion. And so physical exam has, as far as I can remember, been the primary tool. And I, I can't recall anybody that we've done um, testing on off the top of my head. But I think that there has been, there have been a few patients where we've wanted to do that. Yeah, it's interesting. So I find that patients compensate actually really well from this. However, um, I really, I kind of like set it up to them that it's going to be terrible in terms of the recovery. And then I'd, I'd rather be pleasantly surprised that it's not so terrible. So I usually advise patients, hey, listen, you are going to be really off balance. They're, they're almost never frankly vertiginous after the surgery, but I usually keep them over one night just from a balance perspective to make sure they're doing okay. Um, and, and I tell them, listen, you're going to be like really, really off balance, you know, like solidly for a week. And then for a month, you're going to feel still like not yourself really off balance. And then it takes about three months till it really gets back. And then more often than not, they surprise me. Like I had one guy who I operated on who is a hospital employee. I saw him in the hallway two days later and he was like, doc, I'm doing fine. All those voices in my head are gone. You told me I wouldn't be able to work for like a month and I'm, I'm normal. What are you talking about? Um, and so I, I'd rather have it that way, but the long and short of it is I haven't had any patients who've had like, you know, chronic debilitating um, imbalance, but I'm also really, really cautious. And in fact, um, I'd be cautious about doing either approach and folks who have a significant alternative reason for having balance disturbance. So in that, you know, elderly diabetic vascular path with peripheral neuropathy and poor vision, like not a good candidate either way, probably. That makes good sense. Um, I've got another question, but I'll pause for a second if anybody else wants to ask something. OK. Um, Sometimes I find myself using the CVAMP and OVAMP to convince myself and patients that this is the right thing to do when their symptoms are fairly classic. I mean, how how do you use that in your decision making? And you know, if it's positive versus negative in terms of you know fairly classic symptoms versus not fairly classic symptoms. Yeah, it's interesting. It, it, I would say that um, it's almost, I always order it, but sometimes it's almost superfluous because really I'm only going to consider operating on these patients if they have totally classic symptoms and great radiographic evidence. And then I really want to do mainly the ECOG so I know pre-op what to expect. So I know kind of what, you know, um, what it's going to look like when we go in there and make sure that we have a good ECOG, uh, elevated ECOG pre-op so we can monitor it intraoperatively. Um, there, yeah. So I don't know how much, I, I still get it, but honestly, it's just kind of like acing on the cake, right? It's just to like give yourself reassurance. Um, oh, I know I was gonna say, the other thing, um, I've had a couple of patients who have this like near canal dehiscence, right? Where you have like thin bone of the canal, they have some classic symptoms and you're gonna scratch your head going, what do I do with that? Um, and certainly there have been reports in the literature describing that this you know, surgical management can be used for near dehiscence of the superior canal. Um, and so I have used it in those patients who I'm like, gosh, their radiography is like really close. You know, maybe there's like a little tiny football hissing, but not like the one I showed you where it's definite. Um, and so sometimes I'll use it on those, you know, if it's elevated, I'll feel more comfortable with going in. If their, um, if their electrophysiology is abnormal, I'll feel more comfortable with offering a surgical repair for those patients than I otherwise would. Awesome. Great point. Well, I think there are no more questions. Uh, we might wrap up. Um, thanks again. This was a, a great talk. Great. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for putting this together. It's a great, uh, it's a great session. All right, Dr. Stuckin, take care. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.